Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about low-income students in Trinity Washington University. Pat McGuire has served as president of Trinity Washington University for the past 25 years. Previously, she was an assistant dean at the Georgetown University Law Center and project director for Georgetown's DC Street Law Project. Pat is also a board member of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. Welcome. Great to be with you, Steve. Well, we're delighted you could come. Well, Pat, you've been president for 25 years. Yes. I think that makes you the, the most senior president in Washington. I think it is at this point, yes. I had no intention of being there this long, but every day is wonderful, and I can't tear myself away. Well, how do you relate to your board members? Because I'm assuming some of them probably haven't served for 25 years. Well, that's true. Actually, I was a member of the board, which is how I, I got this job. Uh, and I'm still a member of the board. So I have seen many generations of trustees come and go. I love the board. We have a great working relationship. It's a great board, very devoted to Trinity. And I never forget as president that I work for the board as well as for all of our students and faculty. Well, speaking of who you work for, uh, there was a big brouhaha in the media about you not being invited to the White House uh, in terms of who works for whom. Yeah. Would you say a word or two about that? Well, this question is about the White House Summit on College Opportunity that occurred a few weeks ago. And it was a gathering of presidents of very elite institutions, very distinguished institutions, and more power to them. I don't begrudge anybody who was invited. But the topic of the meeting was about how to serve low-income students very well. And many institutions, not only Trinity, but many institutions that actually do serve a majority of low-income students were not invited. And it seemed to be that the administration was sending the wrong message. The people at the White House told me they didn't mean to overlook anybody, but they thought it was important to get very elite institutions to recognize that they have an obligation to serve low-income students. I can hardly disagree with that, but in doing so, they insulted all of us who are already doing this work, which is very difficult. It's not easy. It's not about just making a pledge and taking a few more low-income students. It's about totally transforming an institution to live a very particular mission to students with great need. Well, speaking of the need, uh, one of the presidents who was invited to that summit was actually sitting in the very seat you're sitting in uh, last year, and he runs one of the programs that helps to encourage low-income students to come to his elite college. Mm -hmm. Some people would argue that he's essentially skimming the top students from low-income sectors around the country instead of those students going to Trinity. Would you agree with something like that? or Well, I don't begrudge any institution having uh, well-qualified students, uh, whether they're low income or high income. This is, this is not a competition. This is not higher ed hunger games. We have to be very clear that every student should go to an institution where there's a great fit, where the programs and services will serve the student very, very well. The problem we have right now is that there's this focus on about 400 very elite institutions and on a very small band of students called high achieving low income students. And the theory seems to be that that small band of high achieving low income students should be matched with these 400 very elite institutions. And you know what that does? First of all, it only reinforces elitism. It says that all the other deserving low income students who might be high achieving but for the conditions of their public schools can't get into the Harvards or the Stanfords of the world. That's not fair. Number two, it's not just about scores on the SAT test or even your grade point average. We have many high achieving students at Trinity, I'm sure they're here at UDC, who but for some of the conditions that they have suffered in their lives, some of the marginalization, educationally, economically, some of the other things in their lives. We educate primarily women, and many of the women at Trinity are young mothers, and they're trying to raise children while also learning calculus and Shakespeare. They are high achieving, but they don't look the same way on the statistics that more middle class or upper middle class students might look who went to very good suburban schools. So, so who is a high achieving low income student? Who deserves? There are millions of worthy students 
in this country who are on the margins of higher education right now. They should be included by all institutions, and those institutions like Trinity, like the University of the District of Columbia and others that serve this population well should not somehow be looked down upon because we do choose as a matter of mission to serve these students. Well, do you think that Michelle Obama is looking down on Trinity relative to Princeton? I don't think that, I'm, I, I've never talked to Michelle Obama about this, I don't think that Michelle Obama has that in her radar screen or, or in her, her head when she talks about her Princeton experience. And good for her to have the Princeton experience and to be a role model. I would like her to come out to Trinity and sit and talk with my students, young women who are graduates of Friendship Collegiate and Ballou and Anacostia High School. And for them, coming to Trinity is just as important as it was for Michelle Obama to go to Princeton. This is the thing, it shouldn't be an either or, it should be an inclusive both end. And in making the point that more students should be accepted to more colleges to get a leg up economically in this country, because the end game in all of this is, this is a knowledge economy. And in spite of all of the rhetoric about how we need auto mechanics and we need people who don't go to college who can do you know, other kinds of work, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, most of the jobs in this country do require a college degree or some kind of post-secondary education. So rather than keeping the funnel narrow and saying that more people should trickle up, we should widen the funnel and say that every student who enrolls in college should have a great experience. And how are we going to do that if there are limited amounts of funds to, to do that? Well, this is, this is the other crux of the problem, and I think the crux of the problem that the Obama administration is still struggling with. You know, President Obama has said that he basically wants to double the number of Americans with a post-secondary credential between now and the year 2020 to go from about 30% to about 60%. Well, if you sit down and do the math of the goal 2020, it would require us to go from about 20 million students enrolled in higher education to anywhere from 35 to 40 million enrolled. There are not enough seats to accommodate goal 2020. How do we make the seats available? Well, one of the things that has to happen is that public universities in the states have to expand their capacity. This is a problem because right now the states are disinvesting in higher education. Just as we're calling for more places, the states are constricting. Uh, the federal government at the same time is constricting in its own way. Many students who are outside the system right now are outside for the reason of money. Money is a great hurdle, whether it's um, money to go to a local community college at very low expense or money to go to a very expensive institution. Students look at the expenses and say, I can't afford that, whether it's $500 or $50,000, depending on the student's economic condition, that they may not be able to get there. So how do we solve this problem? Well, first of all, this is a very wealthy country. You know, there's all this talk about how the federal government can't keep funding higher education, can't keep, can't expand Pell Grants. Well, when you compare the investment the federal government makes in education versus the investment in other things, including the defense uh, of this country, which is very important, but you can see that we have plenty of money in this country. So I don't think it's a lack of resources. I think it's a lack of willpower, number one. Number two, there are people in this country who believe that um, some students just don't deserve to go to college. And unfortunately, some of that appears to be, and I don't want to cast dispersions, but some of it appears to be coinciding with the rise of the populations of color in this country and the demographics of the nation. So as the nation moves toward the day by 2050, when this nation will no longer have a white majority, and in fact when many campuses, including my own, are already campuses that are predominantly minority institutions, some people are looking askance at all of this and saying, well, maybe all those students shouldn't go to college. Maybe they should all be trained to be hotel workers. Um, well, that's not right. Those students have as much right to a great education as we did when we went to college. But this is a willpower and a political issue also. Well, and speaking of the political issue, I mean, couldn't you make the case that some of the public universities need to use more political will to spend more of the resources they have for the students that they claim that they want to attract? Well, this is a, that's a great question. Um, we have studied uh, quite closely the, the changing patterns of public education and private higher education in this country, and some little known facts. You know, public education originally was to be the gateway for low-income students who could not afford the expensive private schools. 
Now we see an inversion of mission and purpose, at least among smaller private universities like Trinity and large flagship state universities. So if you look at the flagships of the big states, you know, Maryland, Virginia, Michigan, New York, you will find in those flagship public universities extraordinarily wealthy families. And they have figured out that they, if they can pay in-state tuition, they don't have to pay that much to go to college. And the universities can, can have very high achieving students um, that they will subsidize through the state tax dollar, uh, and those students will get a great education. Meanwhile, at a school like Trinity, where my median family income is just $25,000 a year, compare that to those flagships where the median family income is over $100,000 a year. We're a small Catholic private institution educating some of the poorest of the poor, 75% Pell Grant eligible. We make it happen, but we're a small university. We don't have the scale that a Maryland has or, or the Virginia system or the New York system or the Pennsylvania system. So yes, the state universities should try to figure out how to make more seats available to more low-income students, but it's full of politics. It's a very difficult question. Well, but I think it's a simple question in some ways because in some ways they could simply spend more money if there was the political will. Well, the, the, the legislators, of course, would have to appropriate more funds for the universities. The universities, I'm sure, would say that they would be delighted, in fact, if they could get larger appropriations. But what about, let's say, the University of Texas, which is a big that university. Is huge. They right. have $20 billion in the endowment. Right. Okay, that $20 billion is larger than the GDP of 20 countries. There you go. Why can't the Texas legislators or Congress say that you can't keep that much money in the bank and you have to spend it on low-income students? Well, uh, of course, why? I mean, why, why, why not? I, you know, we can argue that question. Uh, there's politics, there's tradition, there's history. Um, and there's also the thing in higher ed about building the silo and building the moat around it so nobody can get at it. It's interesting you would raise that because the other night I was on a panel at the American Council on Education meeting. It was sponsored by the Chronicle of Higher Ed. And they said, if we could reinvent the world, what would we, what would we dictate? And I said, well, I would want the wealthiest institutions in this country to share some of their wealth with the poorest institutions so that we could support our students more effectively and then perhaps create pathways so that our students could matriculate into those universities for their graduate and professional programs, for example. I think that wealth that has accumulated in university endowments could certainly be put to good use in the access question. And access just not into associate or baccalaureate programs, but even on into masters and professional programs. I think there's a way to do it, but there needs to be willpower to do it and a way to look at money differently from the way we look at it right now. Well, I, I think that's interesting. If you look at the Washington, D.C. example, Georgetown University, where you spent a number of years, yes. uh, has a fair amount of money compared to Trinity. Yes. I wonder if there's a way that the city council or the mayor could say gently, you know, why don't we take 1% of the proceeds of such and such and fund all these schools that school, not only Trinity, but also high schools, elementary schools that really need the funds. Well, in a way, the city is doing that. I will say um, uh, this about the city and, and also about Mayor Gray, who I know is under a great deal of fire right now, but he's done some really good things for education in the city, dare I say. One of the things he did was to make mayor scholarships available from the city surplus last year. And our students at Trinity received quite a bit of support um, from the Mayor Scholarship Fund. Uh, the city also has a great number of philanthropists who have gone to pitch for, uh, for um, DC students, many of whom come to Trinity. Uh, somebody like Donald Graham, uh, former owner of the Washington Post. Um, Ted Leonsis is involved with the College Success Foundation. I think the big universities like Georgetown and George Washington University and others, they certainly give a tremendous amount of aid to students. I will point out, and this is a, also an interesting little known fact, Neither Georgetown's endowment nor George Washington's, and they're, they're the two wealthiest universities in the city, they don't hold a candle to the size of the endowments like Texas that you just mentioned, or Harvard or Stanford. Um, their endowments are in a billion or two, which certainly is a lot of money in my mind, but nowhere near the tens of billions that, that universities in other locations have. But how much do we need for the rainy day fund? Well, you have to look at the size of the opera. I mean, this gets into also the way uh, financial credit ratings play into this whole college cost. 
uh, college endowment mix, and, and I have uh, argued about this for a long time that I think Congress doesn't even understand this. In fact, those endowments or any kind of reserve funds, even, even our little reserve fund at Trinity, are very important to the rating agencies and to lenders. So for example, I mean, we're about to build a new academic building at Trinity for the first time in 55 years. It's our first new building for academics and it's desperately needed. I don't think anyone would quarrel with it, but the bank wants to know how much money are you saving. Well, we're just doing one building every 10 or 20 years the big universities at Georgetown, at GW, American, they're doing multiple buildings, they're renovating infrastructure, so they have to go to the debt markets to borrow money to do that. And of course, the creditors are saying, well, how much money do you have in reserve? So a lot of that endowment or reserve fund is what you have to have to keep Moody's happy. Moody's also, by the way, tends to be a source of driving up tuition prices, because Moody's likes uh, a lot of net tuition revenue, and also pretty much repressing college access, because Moody's does not want an institution to spend a lot of money on financial aid, nor does it want a lot of students enrolled who might be at risk of not completing. And this gets to what's going to happen with the new federal rating system that the U.S. Department of Education is working on, because we see how it happens with private credit rating already, that if you have any kind of system that measures a university by certain factors, including retention, completion, money, you will see universities behave in ways that may not be helpful to the very students the administration is trying to help. Well, that's a problem, because on one hand, we have pressures going in one direction and then pressures going in the other direction. Right. Well, well, absolutely. And so universities have to decide which pressures do I need to respond to most? What do I care about the most um, with regard to this new proposed federal rating system? Um, I believe that universities will care about it, but they're not going to care as much about it as they will care about their, their Moody's credit rating, because credit rating is about money. It's not clear what the federal rating system will be about, um, and there's a lot about it that's still very murky. What we do know is at the end of the day, however, it is very risky to enroll a lot of low-income students, because low-income students do not go through college on the same kind of pathway that a traditional, predominantly white, middle class, upper middle class student went through in the 1960s. You know, I, I'm fond of saying all the time, Gidget doesn't go to college anymore. Uh, my students are not campus co-eds. My students at age 18, 19, 20 are young working mothers who are also, by the way, trying to earn an English degree or a political science degree. They may not finish that degree in four or five or six years. It might take them eight or 10 years to finish that degree. We love what we do, but some people will look at that and say, well, that's not very successful because the old measure is that you have to finish in four years. We disagree. We believe that every educational experience is an important step forward in life and that even if it takes a little longer, it's okay because that's just different. But some people measure difference as not good enough. Well, is there a way to do measurements of the rating system in rating system A or B or C? Perhaps there are different rating systems and measurements. Well, this is part of what's going on in the higher ed universe right now and, and the dis very discussions that are going on with the Department of Education, with college presidents and the Department of Ed are, first of all, one size does not fit all. You cannot measure Trinity's success the same way you measure Georgetown's success or even Montgomery College's success. Montgomery is a community college, Trinity's a small women's college, Georgetown's a large co-ed university. Um, so we need to have an understanding that mission affects how you measure success. And traditional accreditation has always done that, but unfortunately federal systems tend not to do that. Uh, the second thing is we've asked for the feds to consider changing some of the way they collect and count data because one of the problems is that although 75% of undergraduates today are non-traditional by some characteristic, what does that mean? They commute, they go part-time, they're working, they're parents, they're not supported by parents, and so forth. 75%, who knew? Department of Ed knows that, but Department of Ed only counts in its database for purposes of retention and completion statistics and other statistics like that, full-time, first-time freshmen, which are a very tiny piece of who goes to college today. And this is a big problem that we're all talking about because if you don't look at the whole, 
you're going to measure the wrong thing and you're going to come to the wrong conclusion. Well, I read recently uh, Andy Rosen's book uh, oh. from Kaplan. Yeah. And he argues that basically the reason that the sector, that his sector is growing is because basically schools like yours aren't satisfying the needs of the students. I may be paraphrasing that in, in, in not an articulate way, yeah. but essentially that's what I thought the argument was. Well, here again, I don't think it's a competition or, or you know, what I call the Hunger Games of higher education. I don't think it's about um, Kaplan versus Trinity. In fact, uh, I know a lot of people at Kaplan. I, I think for what they are chose, choosing to do, you know, that's, that's their business and they should do that. Um, I think some students want a quicker, faster way to get a credential so that they can get a job more quickly. And, and for s students for whom the link between education and job is immediate and urgent, there may be a place for the for-profit universities that do exactly that. I think the federal government is concerned that some for-profits, and I won't say you know which it is, but some may not do that job connection as well mm -hmm. as they should. Um, the trinities of the world have long been about the broader based liberal arts education, which some people love to criticize as not leading to a job, but in fact, if you talk to most employers, what do most employers want? They want people who can read critically, who can write well, who can argue persuasively, who can be numerate. And those are the basic skills of a great liberal arts education. So in fact, although there's all this rhetoric about needing to train computer technicians, the fact of the matter is we train thinkers, and that's who needs to be going into the workforce. But then how do you deal with the political pressures of parents who are saying, my son or daughter needs a job when they finish university XYZ? Well, in fact, most of us have really good job outcomes, and this is another controversial piece in the proposed new rating scheme for, for the U.S. Uh, Department of Education. Um, we don't formally collect the data because the government has never formally asked us to formally collect the data, but we're going to have to start collecting it. We informally collect the data, and we know that we've got great outcomes. So at Trinity, we know we surveyed the last 10 years' worth of our students. 95% were employed or in graduate school. Those who weren't employed or in graduate school were retired or home taking care of kids or taking care of elder parents. You know, they weren't sitting on the street with a tin cup. Um, their median salary that they reported was around $65,000. That's pretty good 10 years out of college. And most of our students go on to careers as teachers and counselors and, and um, that sort of work. They're not going into computer science and, and, and engineering, which are higher paid uh, positions. Um, I think most universities could produce the data to convince the public, Congress, parents, that certainly the students do get jobs upon graduation. The other piece about this jobs thing that, that I hasten to note, all of this talk about higher ed and jobs is post-recession. And higher ed did not cause the recession. A big piece of the jobs calamity right now continues to be the behavior of mega corporations that don't really want to open up the employment pipeline because they're still not sure where this government is going. And there's a lot of both finger pointing going on and a lot of economic shell games going on that hurts the job market at the end of the day. But it's not because colleges are failing that some graduates can't get jobs by and large. A few cases, possibly, but don't use a bad case to generalize to the whole sector. The bigger problem is the economy. Well, and speaking of the economy and the employment pipeline that you just referenced, how does your career center work? Oh, our career center does all kinds of work with our students. The first thing that's important to point out, like many career centers now, we don't guarantee job placement. It is not a placement agency. It is a career center, meaning we help students develop the skills and talents they need in order to be able to pursue work effectively. Uh, we do bring employers to campus. We have job fairs. Uh, we do post jobs um, online and, and students can learn how to interview. The mo probably the most important thing the Career Center does is teach students how to interview, uh, teach students how to prepare a great resume, and also, this is key, working with faculty to help faculty understand the alignment between what they're teaching in the class and what the employers are expecting in the career fields. That's a big piece. The other thing our Career Center does is manage um, uh, externships, uh, internships, uh, all kinds of experiential learning, which is key to postgraduate life. We're fortunate being in Washington. There are so many internship opportunities here, and frequently those turn out to be the gateways to the professional careers of the students. Fair enough. 
In terms of adjuncts, yes. uh, what do you think about the growing use of adjuncts around the country? Well, adjuncts, um, you know, and I speak from the perspective of being here in D.C., having been an adjunct at Georgetown Law School myself for, for a couple of years, um, and then at Trinity we certainly have a very large, very dedicated cadre of adjunct professors who we couldn't operate without. Um, I know some people look at adjuncts as as possibly being on the fringe of education. I don't consider them that way at all. I consider them integral to our enterprise. Um, and they help us uh, to teach, particularly in subject matters, where the full-time faculty do not have expertise or do not have practical experience. What's important about adjuncts in a major urban area like Washington is that we are able to draw on people with, with real world expertise. So in the political science program, um, we can have adjuncts who actually are working in politics. In the School of Education, we can actually have teachers and principals teaching. Uh, in the School of Nursing, we actually have nurses and healthcare professionals teaching. That is really important to blend that theoretical knowledge that full-time faculty have with the practical knowledge of the adjunct faculty. Um, some people you know, claim that, well, adjuncts are trying to cobble together careers uh, and can't get full-time jobs. Um, I think that's unfortunate, and I think if an adjunct wants a full-time teaching position, we all should probably do more to try to work with those who want full-time teaching. Many of the adjuncts we see at Trinity are actually full-time professionals who love teaching on the side, and that's a very different kind of an adjunct position from those who are teaching five or, or ten courses by roaming around. Well, fair enough. Pat, I think we're going to have to say goodbye. I appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it, too. If you would like additional information about Pat McGuire, please visit trinitydc.edu. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.